So this is a recap of using CSS to style an HTML page. Right now I have this HTML file that is an excerpt of a Wikipedia page. I can show a preview of that. It's very black and white. Uh, there are headers, um, some links, some images. Not a lot going on, but it's also not very styled. If I wanted to add some styles, the way I would recommend doing that is in the style.css file. And I'm going to remix this project so that I can do that without changing the current state of it. And once that has finished remixing, I'll work through some simple CSS that we can do to start affecting the style of the web page. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see that the page is still starting up over on the right side of the page. Great. So in my style.css file, I can um, I can write CSS statements. And the way I might do this, I might start with changing the background of the page. And in order to do that, usually what you'll do is style the body. So you can style the entire body element by selecting the body as we have here, and then um, change something. So we could change the background color, for example. Um, maybe I want gray. And when we do, you'll see that the color changes over on the right. Maybe I want something a little bit lighter. I'm misspelling beige there something like that. And I might want some spacing around the content. One way to do that, if I don't want to change the HTML, I just want to style what's here. I could um, add a, mar a margin to the body. Uh, actually, in this case, I'll, I'll add a padding of, say, 50 pixels. And that will introduce some space around uh, all of the content on the page. So now uh, I might also want to change the font family, the, the font that our page uses. Now the reason I'm using a generic word like sans serif is when you use sans serif, um, the browser is basically going to use the best sans serif font that the computer has available to it. You can specify more specific fonts before that, say Helvetica, um, and if the computer has that, it will use it. If it does not, it will fall back to one of the fonts that comes after it. So now I might want to look back at my HTML file and see what other kinds of things I have. For example, there are a bunch of links here. I might want to style some of the links. And with links, I'll change the color, the text color. I'm using simple terms for the colors here because I don't generally know the codes for colors off the top of my head. Um, but in a moment I'll show you how to walk through that a little bit more. If I want to get rid of the underlines I can say text decoration none. Um, 
text decoration underline is what gives the links the underline that they have. And um, if I only wanted to give underline when the mouse is over the link, I can say a colon hover. So I'm selecting links that have the mouse over them, mouse hovering over them. And I could say text decoration underline. So now when I put the mouse over a link, it's still reloading. It's taking a moment. Uh, but now when I put the mouse over the link, you'll see that it gets underlined. So that seems like a pretty good start. Um, we also have some paragraphs in here. We could work with the paragraphs. Uh, generally, depends on what you're doing, uh, but you might want to change the margin on paragraphs. The reason there is space between paragraphs is because there's margin there. So for example, I could say margin zero and that would get rid of all of that space between the paragraphs. I don't generally recommend this. You can see that it gets very hard to read this text with no margin, but maybe you want to uh, work on what the top margin is. Can we get 20 pixels on the top? And you'll see it's more or less what it was before. If we make that larger, should see a pretty significant difference. Great. So for, for a first time playing around with CSS, you might not do a whole lot more than this, um, but it's good to get familiar with the properties and how you're selecting individual elements. And again, I'm selecting an element, selecting all of the elements on a page when I say just the letter P or just the letter A. I'm selecting all of the A elements on the page or all the P elements on the page. One last thing we might want to style is that are the images. We might want some room around the images. We might say image and add some margin around the image. For example, that adds space all the way around the image. If I was doing any more than this with CSS, I would almost certainly be using developer tools. And I'm using Firefox here, so it might look a little bit different to Chrome or other browsers that you might be using. Um, but going to open up the preview in a new window so that I can better see the developer tools once I open them. And I will either right click on the page and go to inspect element and that will open up the developer tools. Or if I wanted to do it the long way in Firefox, you can click on the options menu, go to web developer and toggle tools. It's a similar thing in Chrome, and once you do that, you can see every single element. You can open up individual elements and find the elements within those elements, and so on. But if I had a lot of elements and they were deeply nested, this would be really cumbersome. So what I'll almost always do is use this pick an element, select an element button, and when you do that, it's kind of the inverse of doing it over here in the elements area. What happens is you put your mouse over elements on your page and it highlights them over on the right under your elements. So for example, if I wanted to dig into the image styling, I could click on image. You'll see that it gets selected over here on the right. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so I can look at it. You can get rid of other things that are taking up too much space. Because really I want to focus on this. 
Um, for all of the images, because we have this image selector, I can affect the margin on that. Um, I can press the up arrow and that will increase the margin on all sides of the image. I can also click to the right anywhere in this white space and that will create a new property for me. It's like adding a new line in your CSS. And I might say, actually, I want the top, the bottom margin rather, to be zero. I don't want that spacing on the bottom. And now if I hover over, you'll see it shows you the, the spacing over on the left. The margin is yellow here. In Chrome, it's a slightly different color, but it's the same principle. So, like I said, I will almost always test out my changes here and then go back to the code and copy them over once I'm happy with them. As I said before, I don't know the codes for colors in general, so what I will usually do is select the element that I want to change the color of, go down to where the color is determined, and if you click on the color itself, you get a color picker. In most browsers, this is the case. So I can pick a color that I'm happier with, and now I have the color code. And that's generally, it's a nice way to test it out because you can actually see it on the page in the context that it will be in. And similarly, if we wanted to change the body background color, you can click on the body. And here, I might do some kind of light gray, something like that. And it's as simple as that, usually, um, for, for straightforward CSS changes. OK, so the next exercise we're doing with CSS, we're looking at a page where I have placed an overlay on top of a map that I made in Cardo. In this case, the Cardo map is loaded in an iframe. It's taking up the full width and height of the page. And the overlay is positioned over here in the top right of the screen. Now the way this works is I'm using absolute positioning. And I'll open up the developer tools so we can see that up close. If you find the overlay element, either by clicking on it in the elements panel or using the select an element tool to select it, You'll see down here, I'll make that a little bit larger, you'll see how the overlay is styled. And it's styled using absolute position. Absolute position allows you to specify exactly where that element will go on the page. And then when we say write 25 pixels, we're saying 25 pixels from the right most side of the page and top 25 pixels, 25 pixels from the top of the page. So if I wanted to move this over to the left, it is pretty much as simple as changing right to left. And you should see once that gets updated, it's over on the left now. If I wanted to tweak how far from the left, I can click on the 25 pixels can use the arrow keys, or if I needed to change it more than that, I could type the value in that I want. Now, I had it over on the right because that seemed to work better for the code that I'm working with. So I will just come in here and switch it back to the way it was to right. The other thing to keep in mind here uh, with absolute positioning and 
in particular with web maps is that there are many layers uh, on the page that are on top of each other. And the Z index in CSS controls where your layer is in that stack of layers. So in this case, we're setting it to a very large value that will should always put it on top. That's the Z index. If I turn this off, it still appears. It worked OK. Um, if we set this to something negative, then it is now behind the map. Not usually what you want to do. Seems that in this case, we could have gone as low as 0 or 1 with the Z index, and it would have worked fine. But in general, it's a good thing to keep in mind. You might need to change the Z index to fix the ordering. Now, with a negative Z index, that element is still there. If I could find it here in my elements area, you see when I hover over it, it's actually still there. It's just behind the map. Okay. So all I want to do here is um, use the classes in my HTML to change the styles. So I'm using class selectors here. And the reason I'm using class selectors, if you look at the HTML, is that this is my overlay element. Within the overlay element, I have a list of legend items. In this case, the entire home and apartment is one item. That is this line. Private room, shared room. Each of these has a circle that comes before the name before the label. And that circle is created, we're using a span here to do that. And the reason we're using classes in this case, we're using a class legend circle, we're using a class because we want to be able to style many of these elements at once. We want to be able to style all of them and have them come out the same way. And <clears throat> You'll see that in our CSS, we have a dot legend circle CSS statement. You can see that also switching back to our styles.css. You'll see dot legend circle. These are the style rules we're using. Background is black. Border radius is 50%. That's what makes it a circle. We're setting the display to inline block, which allows us to change the width and height of, the, of this element. Um, we're giving it a margin on the right side so that there's a little bit of room between the circle and the label. And we're giving it a width and height of 10 pixels. So the nice thing about having a class that does all of the circles is we can change all of the circles at once. We can just change one of these, and it changes all of them. Okay, So we want to make these colors of these black dots match the ones on the page itself, on the map rather. And if I had Cardo open, I would dig into Cardo and find out exactly what those colors are. But in this case, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, but first of all, I'm going to make rules for each of the specific kinds of legend circles that there could be. So we have legend circle for each of these, but each one has their own special class, which only styles that one element. So in this case, the dot for entire home and apartment. And when you're writing a class selector in CSS, remember that you start it with a period. So you're saying, I'm going to select a class from my HTML. I'm going to paste in my class mostly to make sure I don't make a typo, add some curly braces, and now I can style it however I want. I could say background red. 
and now you should see as we do the circle here is now red you can see that because I had that selected earlier it's showing up here in the styles and well what if I wanted to make sure I got the right color for this entire home or apartment in this case I'm pretty sure that those uh, purplish dots are the ones that I want. I can actually use this eyedropper tool in the color picker and come down here and select the color that I want. And now that I have that, I can copy it and select it and copy it and put it in my CSS. When I come back over, you should see that it matches. I'm going to do the same exact thing two more times. I'll walk through it as I do. Going back to the HTML, so copying this class, Legend Circle Private Room. And I'll use the eyedropper again. In this case, I'll use the eyedropper tool and find a blue one. Okay, that's the color I want. And then finally, the green. Again, I'm using the eyedropper tool. You can do it this way and then double check in your Cardo that you're getting the exact right colors. Oh, I forgot to move over the class name that I want. So I think it's circle shared room. Let's see if I'm right. Background. That looks, that looks more or less correct. Um, I might have gotten some of the colors wrong. What I would do next is log into my Cardo account and double check. Um, but for now, this, this more or less does what we want it to do. I just want to look back at the classes. So just want to reiterate that these classes are entirely made up on your part. All you need to do is be consistent when you use them. You will use classes in your HTML, in your CSS, and sometimes in your JavaScript. So you just want to make sure that you make a class name that is sp descriptive enough that you'll be able to remember it. And when you look at it, you know what it's trying to do. I think in this case, legend circle, entire home, that's pretty descriptive. So try, try to do that as you do. Um, if we, one nice thing about the legend circle, as I said before, doing a lot of the heavy lifting, it makes the circle for us, is that if we edited this map down the road, we needed to add something else to the legend, I can copy one of the legend items and say... Uh, maybe there's a boathouse option. I don't know. And I'll add a new class. I'm just making up a class now. Boathouse. Legend Circle Boathouse. And if I go back to my page, you'll see there's a new item here in the legend. And you'll see that it has that default color because there's no there's nowhere overriding that background color. And maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to add something in my CSS. Again, I'll use the dot to specify that I'm talking about a circle, a uh, class, and I will set the background. 
So that's, that is how you'll be using classes to style elements using CSS. Okay, now I want to talk about getting your elements sitting side by side using CSS. Up until recently, this was not always a straightforward thing to do. Um, and to show you an example of what I mean by getting your elements sitting side by side, here you go. I have a map over here on the left, and over on the right I have a sidebar where I could describe the map, I could link to data sources, I might decide to put my legend over here in the sidebar, I might decide to include information from my data set over on the right in the sidebar. That is up to you. So um, again, to get these two elements side by side, you have to do a little bit of work in CSS, and I'll walk through how I think about doing something like this. And first, we'll do that by looking in the HTML. So in the HTML, you can find the iframe that is drawing our map. That is this part of the page. And you can also find, if you look a little bit, you can find the area that contains the content for our sidebar. So it includes the title, it includes the data source. So um, in order to get these two things side by side, I need to wrap both of them in divs. So we haven't necessarily talked about divs too much. Divs are generic wrappers around content. And these are block, um, block elements, which means they usually want to take up the full page. And we're doing a little bit of work to make them not take up the full width of the page. And um, I can um, comment out part of the code to comment is not going to work. I'll comment out just that part. And you'll see that uh, now they are, because they're block elements, they're taking up the entire width of the page, taking up as much space as they can. And the first element takes up as much as it can, and then after that, vertically, below it, comes the rest of the content. And that's how block elements work in general. But as you see here, this key this key line within our code changes that pretty dramatically. So we have another div around the columns called row. I gave it a class row. That has display set to flex. Now flex is referring to flex box, which is a way of um, dynamically ordering your content and aligning it. And um, as I said earlier, it's a relatively recent addition to CSS. And if you find yourself in a situation where you think you need things side by side, I would consider using flex. So I'm using flex. I'm using the flex direction row. So I'm saying I want this to be a row. I want the first element and then the second element to be horizontally to the uh, to the right of the first element. And 
that's all it really takes to get elements side by side. Um, I did a few other things here. So for example, I created a column left, which you'll see in the HTML. That contains my map in this case. And I created a column right, which contains the sidebar. If you look in the CSS, I'm telling the column left that it can grow up to two, which is proportional to all of the other elements, and the right that it can grow up to one. So again, proportionally. So one third and two thirds, essentially. And that is why you see that the sidebar is taking up uh, about half as much room as the map. If I opened up the inspector, you'll see that this dynamically shifts a bit. The sidebar gets smaller, as does the map element. And if I select the column left and I made it grow more, you see that it's proportionally getting bigger, and it will stay proportionally bigger, like this. You don't have to use flex grow. I think it's handy in this situation, but if I turned off flex grow on both of them, uh, you'll see something like this happen. Um, And that's not usually what you want. Um, usually you at least want uh, the map to grow, even if the sidebar does not grow. If you don't set flex grow on an element, it only takes up as much space as it needs to. So the sidebar is that narrow because it didn't have anything inside it making it wider. Um, I could specify that uh, it needs to be a specific number of pixels wide. And now it will always be this width. It will always be 300 pixels. The map will just have to live with that and it will adjust as needed. Um, the situation where <clears throat> we get to a point where there's actually not even 300 pixels for the sidebar, that's when it starts to shrink down. Um, and if we really, really wanted it to always be 300 pixels, we could also set min width to 300 px. And you should see that it it does everything it can to stay that wide. Even when we get this small, it adds a scroll bar so that it can remain 300 pixels wide. This is a totally fine approach for a sidebar with a map. Um, you might also, you might want to use flex grow though. Uh, the reason I like using flex grow in this case is that um, I need to turn off the width and min width for that to work. Is um, on all displays, it will stay proportional. Um, so I think that's that's often more or less what you want, um, but you will most likely want to test your web page on uh, screens with various widths so you can see how well it's working for you. So that's that is a quick dive into using how I'm using Flexbox to make two elements side by side. In CSS. Okay, this last bit of the CSS recap, I want to look at making a website mobile friendly. So it's hard to tell by looking at this site whether it is or not mobile friendly, um, but why don't we dig into how we would check that out? So you might be tempted if you're inspecting this page. One one way of um, of doing this is to just make the developer tools so wide that you're looking at it about the width of a phone. And 
sometimes that's fine. Sometimes that's all you need. Uh, but most developer tools will have some way of emulating a device. We're using responsive design mode, as Firefox calls it here. If you click on it, you'll see um, that it picks a device for you. And you can pick a different device and see how roughly your website will look on that. And mostly it's setting the width and height. So uh, if I was looking at this on an iPhone, it might look like this. An older one with um, a smaller screen would look like that. And an iPad is a bit taller and wider, as expected. So um, again, you can see up here next to the device name, the width and the height. You can also flip it if you want. Um, but what I'm going to focus on for the purposes of this is just the width. So I'm going to assume that if your width, if the width of the screen gets small enough, probably want to rearrange the elements a little bit so that it's still <clears throat> possible to uh, see all the information on the screen and hopefully do so in a way that's not frustrating when you're on a phone. So I can turn off that responsive design toolbar uh, so you can see what it looks like um, on a wide screen as I'm looking at it right now. It's got two columns, one column for the map, one column for the sidebar. And as we saw with the responsive design mode, once when you make it um, the size of a phone, it's no longer two columns side by side. It's now one column, which is very typical for phones. Um, and some of the information, but not all of it, ends up below the map instead of to the right of the map. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is how to change your CSS so that once the screen is below a certain width, we're adjusting the other parts of the page that we want to adjust. Um, so the HTML for this, it's relatively straightforward. If you saw the part where I talked about Flexbox, this will be um, just a review. Um, so I have two columns. I have one div, one, for some reason that ended up on another line. Uh, so I have two divs for the columns, the left column and the right column. These are the map and the sidebar, respectively. And I have a row that wraps the two columns. This row defines uh, how those two columns interact. And looking back at my CSS, again, this is more or less the flex flexbox section. I'm saying display flex, flex direction row to make it horizontal, horizontally oriented instead of vertically. And um, specifying how the columns grow and up to here should look more or less familiar to you by now. Down here below line 26 is where you start to see something new. So to keep my media queries relatively simple, I'm just going to specify one media query in this case. And I'm saying, um, saying at media, and then in parentheses are the conditions under which this CSS will run. So only if the max width of the screen is 600 pixels. So going back to the responsive design um, button, you'll see that the width of this one is 360. So it is below that max width. So all of this CSS will be used. And there are other ways to define media queries. You can look at the height of the 
screen, you can specify a min width instead to say only have these styles affect screens larger than a certain size. And I'm not being very specific about um, which what number I'm using here. I'm not going to say exactly 360 pixels wide because what if the person's using an iPhone and it's 375 pixels wide? I still want it to be a phone style. I could probably bump it down to say for uh, 450, 480, somewhere in there. For our purposes, 600 is fine. Um, and, and that's what I'll stick with. So again, all we're using the media query for here is to say if the screen width is below a certain size, change the styles in this way. Within that media query, we're going to see pretty standard CSS. You're selecting the body, you're changing the margin and padding on that body. So we're getting rid of the margin and padding because we want our content to take up as much of the space as it can on the phone. And then we're changing the height of the left column because we want the map to take up around 90% of the screen, if possible. And why don't we dig into that a little bit? So I'm going to find column left in my elements. And you'll see here, hovering over it, you'll see that the height is set here. And I can, I can adjust that, and you should see a little bit of a change. If I change it to 50 VH, now it's taking up, it's trying to take up about 50, 50% um, 50 of the height. I think 90 is pretty good in this case. I think it works okay for this situation, so I'll probably leave it there. Um, not doing too much to column right itself. But the big thing that you really want to notice is that the row is no longer actually a row. It's actually turned into a column now. And that happens through this flex direction property. If I turn that off, you'll see that this <clears throat> the two elements within the row go back to being horizontally oriented or oriented as a row. But when I change this flex direction, I'm shifting them around. And I'm saying the first element, instead of being the leftmost one, it's now the topmost one in this column. So you can see how one line of CSS, and if we want to find that in our CSS, we'll go to our media query. And we'll look for the style that is affecting the row, this dot row. And um, you'll see flex direction is set to column. If we scroll back up, see that flex direction is set to row originally. Okay, so that one changing that one property really has a huge effect on how mobile friendly this page is. I wouldn't want to use this on my phone. There's not much room to look around on the map. Um, there's a lot of white space, and that's generally not a good idea on a phone. Um, so reorient reorienting to columns is a great idea. Uh, the last thing I'll look at is uh, this column right H2. I'm setting the display to none. What's that do? If I dig into column right and look at H2, when I hover over it, it just doesn't show up on the page right now. And that's because of this display none. Display none will hide the element that it's talking about. If I uncheck that, you'll see that it comes back. I did this because I wanted to take up less room on the screen. And you'll see that I already have a title up here at the top. It felt a little redundant in this orientation. So I set the display to none. Um, and you could do this with anything you want to hide when you're making a mobile uh, friendly site. You could set the whole column right to display none.
like that, and now my map takes up all the screen, right? So, um, just a quick recap, when you want to change styles for a specific screen width, we'll use a media query, and those start with at media, and then in parentheses, the condition that you're uh, styling against. In this case, only when the width is up to 600px. And then within those curly braces, you write plain old CSS. You select elements, such as the body, something with class row, and you set the properties on those elements. Hope that was helpful.